Hello, and uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, uh, depending on uh, where you're patching in from. And uh, welcome to the second day of our event on the global impacts of content moderation. Uh, my name is Michael Karen Nicholas. I'm the Wikimedia Fellow at uh, Yale Law School. Um, uh, and uh, I, I will remind everybody at the outset uh, that this meeting is being recorded um, for uh, posting to our YouTube page uh, later on. Um, and without any further ado, uh, I will turn things over to uh, our fabulous mo moderator for this session on uh, comparative uh, global approaches to intermediary liabil liability, uh, Corinne McSherry, who's the legal director of Electronic Frontier Foundation. Uh, take it away. Well, <clears throat> excuse me, sorry, a little early in the morning for me, I'm still getting caffeinated, but thank you all for, for coming to this panel and for Coming to this conference, um, I watched the panels yesterday and they were really, really interesting. And I think this is such an important topic and I'm planning to learn a lot myself. Um, I already did yesterday and I will in the next hour um, from a set of very, very um, esteemed experts who are going to talk to us about how intermediary liability is handled in different parts of the world um, and what lessons we can learn from each other, what we, lessons we can learn here in the United States where I am, um, but also what um, lessons all of us can learn from our different regions. Um, so what we're gonna do is, um, I'm just gonna introduce the panelists so you know who you're talking to. And then I'm gonna ask each of them to give some opening remarks to kind of help set the stage for the conversation by talking about how intermediary liability laws work and in their respective areas of expertise. And then, um, and then one lesson, one or two lessons that um, we, they think other people could learn from, from, how, from their research um, and from how things are handled in different places. Um, and then we're gonna have a, a few sort of provocative questions um, to have um, to sort of start the conversation. And, um, and then we're gonna open it up. And hopefully at that point, there'll be some questions from the audience. And, um, and so I'm hoping this will be kind of a fun and interactive um, discussion. So let me tell you who we have. Um, now, these are abbreviated versions. All of them have very impressive biographies. Um, so I'm going to give you the short versions. Um, so first, we have Emily Helt. She is a researcher at the Leibniz Institute for Media Research where she focuses on freedom of expression in the digital public sphere. She works on platform regulation, social media governance, the effects of new technologies on opinion, formation and public discourse, and also the exercise of fundamental rights in the context of algorithmic decisions. She's an associated research with um, the Humboldt Institute for Internet and Society, and has been a visiting fellow with the Information Society Project at Yale, and a guest researcher at the Center for Cyber Law and Policy. Um, Andres Calderon is the chair of the academic law department of the Universidad del Pacifico in Peru and director of the legal clinic for the defense of freedom of information and transparency. He's also an associate researcher at the Center for Studies on Freedom of Expression and Access to Information at the Universidad de Palermo. Um, he's a former journalist and a member of the Ethics Tribunal of the Peruvian Press Council and his work focuses on freedom of expression, media law, intermediary liability, content moderation, and competition, um, specifically in connection with information and news markets. Um, Mishi Chaudhary is a technology lawyer. She has a law practice in both New York and New Delhi. Um, she's a partner at Moglin and Associates and a legal director of the Software Freedom Law Center. She's been the primary legal representative for many of the world's most significant free software developers like Debian, Apache Software Foundation, and OpenSSL. She consults with and advises established businesses and startups using free software in their products and services all around the world. And in 2010, she founded the SFLC, a nonprofit organization representing the rights of internet users and free software developers in India. So as you can gather from this, we have quite a varied, um, quite varied expertise here, which is fantastic. It's gonna lead to a really interesting conversation. Um, so I'd like to start the conversation with um, Amelie. Can you tell us a little bit about how intermediary liability is um, handled in the areas you study? Um, hi, and thanks for having me. I'm really happy to be here and um, 
uh, having, having been in, uh, at Yale last year, it's truly a pleasure. Um, so what I can tell, I, I would like to just um, give you a few insights on um, uh, the situation in Germany or in the EU right now. And, um, and this is sort of a technical part, but I think it will help us discuss um, the regional aspects. So um, in the EU, the e-commerce directive is the legal framework for online services. And under Article 14, service providers are not liable for user-generated content on the condition that the provider does not have actual knowledge of illegal activities or information and um, that they, the provider uh, acts um, uh, fast to remove or to disable access uh, to the information. Um, what happened in 2015 is that um, after or um, as a, a consequence of the war in Syria, um, Germany welcomed over a million people from uh, from, from the Middle East, mostly from Syria. And uh, we witnessed, or uh, there was a, a peak of, of hate speech on um, uh, social networks um, during that time. And after the, the, the government tried to, to pressure um, social networks to, to self-regulate more, so especially um, uh, tried to, to, to push uh, Facebook to self-regulate or to remove hate speech uh, faster, um, they then, there was no response to that really. And then in 2017, the German parliament um, passed this law called the Network Enforcement Act, um, which we call the NetsDG. It's probably, you've probably heard of it. Um, and it um, definitely changed the game sort of in Europe. Um, Germany was the first country to pass a law of that kind, and it's now being um, replicated in other countries. So um, this law forces social networks to examine uh, complaints and the first step and to delete content if possible within 24 hours of receiving user complaints. That is the, 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 the principle. Uh, the law refers to uh, sections of the criminal code, the German criminal code, without defining the offenses listed. And the offenses listed in by the, the NetCG are can be conflated as hate speech, um, but it's not hate speech is not a technical term in under German law. Um, so what we have is a, a list of uh, the NetCG list 22 offenses that were already and still are punishable under the, the criminal code, such as libel, defamation, calls for violence. And um, it then uh, the NetCG adds a de facto enforcement obligation for large social media platforms. Um, so anyone breaching these laws, uh, these criminal laws, uh, by posting, commenting, or uploading content on social media uh, platforms still incurs a penalty from the state. And in addition, German law, the, the NetCG now forces social networks to become more active. And so they are obliged to implement procedures um, that ensure um, obviously, con uh, um, obviously unlawful content is deleted within 24 hours of receiving a complaint. And if there's any doubt uh, regarding a takedown decision, the procedure may take up to seven days. After that deadline, a final decision on the lawfulness of a post must be reached and unlawful content needs to be removed. Uh, so either blocked, um, um, geo-blocked or deleted. Um, to the, the, the financial risk or the risks, um, what's at stake, um, the fines for a breach of this obligation can reach up to 50 million euros. Um, and so in addition to complying with these, uh, with this operational provision, social media platforms are obliged to publish biannual reports. So the law has been, um, in, in, has been um, enforced since 2018, January 2018. Um, most platform, platforms have been compliant with the law. Um, and um, they, there's a higher, so what's positive is that there's a higher number of trained um, content moderators who are not lawyers, but who are aware um, of the law and the legal situation in Europe and in Germany. 
so far there's no evidence of overblocking, but the data doesn't, um, the data published in these transparency reports twice a year doesn't, um, they're not uh, nuanced enough for us to tell if uh, the content removal is uh, based on the law or on community guidelines, community standards. So yeah, there's no evidence so far. Um, one lesson uh, and, and here is that um, this law has become sort of a blueprint uh, for less liberal countries and uh, we find that very problematic. And, and, and in, so it's reinforcing the trend of uh, content control and content removal in general. So that's from my side, I hope, um, yeah, add something to the conversation here. Thank you so much. That's, that's very hopeful. Um, and I want to come back to this idea about the lobbying a blueprint for, for other countries. I think we'll want to follow up on that. Um, but let's continue setting, setting the stage for right now. Um, so um, I'll turn it over to Andres. Thank you, Corinne. And thank you all to all the organizers for having me in this amazing event and specifically in this panel. I'm going to address first Peru, but um, some of the features of the Peruvian law resemble what happens in, in most Latin American countries. So I'll jump to some of those countries uh, at some, some time during this uh, initial remarks. So uh, in Peru, like most Latin American countries, um, perhaps with the most notable exception of Brazil, uh, there is no uh, transversal general rule uh, regarding intermediary liability. Um, there's not uh, one equivalent to um, Section 230 uh, or even the EU Information Society Services Directive. There's no statute that grants general immunity for ISPs, nor there is a regime establishing uh, the cases in which liability would be imposed. Uh, that doesn't mean uh, that online intermediaries uh, could not be fine and liable, uh, but its liability would be derived from general uh, tort law principles that are in civil law, we actually name it um, civil uh, extra contractual liability. Um, and those rules uh, require to have an attributing factor that is um, a threshold of uh, neg negligence or intent committed by the infringing party in order to uh, be found liable for uh, a third party uh, content. So that could be depending on uh, the on on the courts. That could be active knowledge of the infringement uh, or. Um, a willful blindness or disregard to take some action once they learn about uh, the infringement. Um, conversely, uh, platforms will not generally be responsible for the content uploaded by, by third parties, by, but there are some exceptions. Um, and I believe that this is probably the general rule applicable in most Latin American countries in which we don't have a specific rule regarding intermediary liability. And there hasn't been a ton of, of litigation and probably, this is probably because um, there is not an expectation of success with regard at least to intermediary liability. Uh, going back to specifically Peru, uh, we cannot find a landmark case in civil lawsuits or criminal procedures. And here's a, a fact that we have to take into account is that defamation cases in Peru, uh, as it is the case in, in most Latin American countries, is a criminal offense. So we, we, we will have to look into civil lawsuits and, and criminal procedures to, to try to understand the, the standard for intermediary liability. But never, we can find some important cases that are starting to shape intermediary liability in other areas of the law, such as data protection and consumer protection. But probably I'll, I'll go deeper into that after a few minutes. Um, I also want to mention that there is a growing trend of bills being introduced and passed, what, being introduced, not passed yet, uh, in some Congress uh, in some South American countries 
that would probably reframe intermediary liability and would give a special active obligations to online platforms, uh, special um, supervision obligations that could conflict with human rights standards. Um, a couple of weeks ago, the first bill for expressly prohibiting fake news in an electoral context in Peru was introduced into the Congress. And while it proposes um, the establishment of uh, electoral penalties, such as the exclusion of a candidate from the election race and imprisonment of, of the people who delivered uh, and spread fake news, there are no specific provisions for intermediary liability or obligations to, to those intermediaries. Uh, we've, we have learned that in the last couple of years, uh, several bills have been introduced in the parliaments of Argentina, Colombia, and Uruguay, to mention a few. Uh, uh, Bruna uh, yesterday mentioned also the case of, of Brazil, of introducing a new bill regarding uh, fake news and intermediary liability. Um, which, uh, by the way, uh, not only is the only country that, that has a general intermediary liability uh, regulation, which is the Marco Civil of Internet, but that same law, I believe, is under judicial scrutiny right now with a pending case before the, the Supreme Court. Um, just to wrap up this um, initial remarks, I want to make one comment and probably one lesson that, that could be inferred from that comment. Uh, and that is um, uh, the largest platforms uh, uh, that, that we all know, uh, Google, Facebook, Twitter, Amazon, uh, do not have country offices in most Latin American countries. And um, in the cases that they are involved, uh, they normally reject jurisdiction. They oppose to, to, being, uh, to being sent to trial in, in, in our countries. So the judicial debate and sometimes the, the legislative dialogue normally involves smaller local or regional platforms. And most of them are, are related to e-commerce. So there are, I, I, I don't believe that there is a case or, or there is a, a debate ongoing, an ongoing debate regarding uh, a purely social media platform. And the other comment I want to make, and this is probably more, more of a lesson, is that um, the, the fact that there isn't legislative clarity nor judicial cl cl uh, predictability regarding internet uh, uh, intermediaries doesn't mean that there isn't a growing demand from users, from consumers, for them to filter the content or filter the activities that are run by third parties in their platforms. And I believe this is why um, this area of the law has been uh, extending its branches to, to different areas, such as data protection and consumer protection. And there has been, uh, there is a, a new trend probably of, of new cases in Peru, in Colombia, and in Argentina, where uh, consumer protection laws are being claimed as the standing as the, as the legal standard for uh, inter, intermediary liability. Um, so I'm, I'm gonna stop there and hopefully we, we can talk some more a little bit later. Yes, I absolutely, we're definitely gonna come back to that point. I think it's really very interesting and potentially quite relevant to a lot of other contexts as well, the way that um, different areas of law are, people are reaching to new um, new areas of law to try to regulate um, in the internet space. Um, but first let's um, let's hear from Mishi. Ciao Dari. Thank you. Um, I do practice in the US uh, as well, but I'm going to be only addressing India. Um, so India is a small country, 1.25 billion people, the largest market for uh, Facebook, WhatsApp, et cetera. Um, and uh, constantly learning uh, from all the other countries and taking away the bad lessons here. Uh, so um, I would, India does have an intermediary liability safe harbor regime, which is um, not exactly on the lines of Section 230 under the Communications Decency Act, but quite similar. However, um, this is a heterogeneous mix 
of uh, uh, various entities who are clubbed together in the definition of intermediaries. So you have your telecom service providers, you have your social media companies, online search engines, but you also have cyber cafes. So it's not just online, but it is also something which translates into brick and mortar uh, offline businesses. So that's the first bit. Um, I would say is um, uh, that um, uh, the, the intermediary liability regime uh, is provided in the statute which mostly says that uh, <clears throat> intermediaries can avail the safe harbor, which is that they will not be held responsible for user generated content if they comply with some due diligence. And those due diligence rules are laid out in subordinate legislation, which the executive keeps revising over a period of time. The first time we encountered them, uh, that was in 2011, when the executive came up with certain rules. And uh, uh, then there has been a lot of Supreme Court litigation. And uh, thereafter, we've seen a new version which was released, a draft in 2018. Um, so when the first version had come, uh, I, uh, we went to the Supreme Court challenging this, that section as well as various other provisions, mostly because they were quite burdensome. And uh, we represented, and I, as a lawyer, had represented um, certain uh, platform companies. And what we got out of the Supreme Court was that an intermediary can avail of the safe harbor uh, if they follow the due diligence, but they were not under any obligation to actively monitor content. However, if they had actual knowledge, and actual knowledge was defined, that if there's a court order, or if there is a government notification about taking down some content, then they must take down that content. And that is the kind of a notice takedown regime which the Supreme Court established after a lot of litigation. But um, as we have seen, um, um, India, um, sometimes I think that India and US are watching um, the same reality TV show, but India is two seasons ahead. Um, so when we started watching this weaponization of uh, social media companies by political parties, the use of various platforms in elections, and sure. WhatsApp, which is a very popular service in India, uh, but something which was uh, called WhatsApp lynchings, which is that spread, spreading of misinformation and disinformation on these platforms, which actually led to offline violence. And that triggered a lot of uh, discussion as well as at least a demand of some kind of action. Now, um, the problem, as I said in the very beginning, because these are very different entities clubbed together as intermediaries, um, uh, but, but the rules and the law is the same. So that creates a very different set of problems. Now, social media platforms, which enable the users to publish our thoughts and emotions directly and spy around on us all the time, um, they have also succeeded in placing themselves outside, outside the sphere of this social responsibility by hiding behind the users. And then as Andres was saying, they keep playing this game of Lex Loci server. My servers are in California, please don't ask me anything even if there is a crime. I'm only a sales office here. Um, that kind of an attitude and also in very serious uh, cases, when they fail to take down content, then that creates a very tricky situation for anybody who's not a government or a company, which is us or people who are civil society or even the users. Now, these businesses are subject to government regulation and because they're in receipt of this de facto or de jure privilege, um, there is, they must constantly negotiate with political power. And that's why I'm sure people saw that there was a lot of discussion about uh, Facebook personal um, and um, uh, the influence of um, whether, whether Facebook's policies of takedowns were being uniformly ap applied in India or not. Why all of this is important is because this does have a lot of bearing on what the government of India is trying to do now. In 2018, as I said, they tried to change these rules, which means it will shift 
how the safe harbor actually works. And um, um, uh, because Corinne asked us about lessons to be also perhaps talked about, I think everything is connected. Uh, data protection, intermediary liability, we all five eyes plus Japan plus India want to break end to end encryption. Let's all get together and make a complete mess about everything. Um, then with the second lesson is um, bad lessons are replicated much faster than the good ones. So that's why when um, uh, Emily started with the NetZDG, it's the 24 hours requirement, which although NetZDG of course uh, allows for extension up to seven days, but India was like, oh, that's perfect. We're going to take 24 hours and now we are going to have that one in our um, requirement. Then the new, the draft rules require things like traceability, which is uh, we want to trace back who is the originator of the message. And that idea was given to them by the great people in uh, San Bernardino when Apple FBI problem started. Oh, WhatsApp lynching, why don't we actually tell everybody that whoever is the originator of the message, maybe we sh they should all be giving us some kind of identification or we should be able to identify them. So, and let's stick it into the safe harbor requirements because governments like to have a throat to choke and the easiest throat to choke is a platform company. And uh, because free speech is complicated, because all the tools are complicated. So the demands are mostly very black and white. Oh, if you have encryption, you must also have a solution, which only works for the good guys, which is us, the government and the law enforcement people. And why can't you make math behave differently for us? Because we are the good people. So that is a requirement of traceability, which was introduced in 2018. It's still a draft. It has still been being discussed. So we at least have some room there. There is another requirement of automated filtering, which again, we have learned from uh, the EU's copyright directive, uh, the article 17, and the, uh, which started as article 13. That taught the very bad lesson of uh, make best efforts. But then India was like, ah, best efforts. If you EU can require you to do it, why can't we require you to do it? And the Lex Loci server has uh, translated into something called that you will have to have a local office. If you have more than 5 million users, then you must have a local office because then the law enforcement agency can come to your local office and demand, and you can stop telling me this is a sales office. So uh, 24 hour demands, traceability, automated filtering, and uh, local office. These are the fun things which we have learned and uh, we will ensure that the mess continues. Uh, thankfully, they're still in the draft stage after two years, but uh, as everything is um, connected, so in uh, October of this year, uh, India decided to join the Five Eyes Alliance and Japan in issuing that weird statement, which is about an end-to-end -end encryption and public safety. Um, uh, some other messes continue to work. Uh, I'm gonna stop there and uh, hope that at least gives you some background about what we are uh, dealing with in India. Great, thank you so much. Um, and let me flag for a moment. We're just clearly in you know, this hour, a tiny, tiny snapshot of what's happening all over the world. There's, there's so much going on. And if I might jump in just for a second, so much of what I just heard you know, is, is you know, very relevant to what's happening in the United States and the debates around Section 230. Um, in particular, for example, the idea of condition in, the, in Section 230, our intermediary liability law, or at least one of them, um, it's really is a safe harbor that doesn't come with a bunch of conditions. It's not that kind of quid pro quo idea. Um, whereas, you know, clearly in other countries, it's, well, you get a safe harbor as long as you do X and Y, and then we can keep tinkering with what X and Y are, is, you know, what, the, what these takedown obligations are going to be, which is actually much more similar to how we handle copyright uh, secondary liability in the United States. Um, <clears throat> um, another thing that I think is completely uh, true, though, is, of course, now, the United States can take some bad lessons from other places. <laughs> and I do think it's quite right that un unfortunately we see uh, the bad lessons rap replicate rapidly um, and, um, and sort of the more positive human rights focused lessons you know, require a lot more work um, to, 
to import. Um, and I'm very interested in particular too in the ways in which uh, I think we're getting, we're gonna keep seeing this, different areas of law are converging. Um, and a lot ends up, can, can potentially end up getting loaded onto intermediary liability discussions. Um, so a discussion that started out as being about protection from mostly defamation, for example, turns into a discussion about um, encryption. And, um, and again, be, once you start down the path of conditioning the protections um, on, um, on certain kinds of obligations, you know, then you can just build in all, every obligation you want a platform to have, that's the way to get it. Um, because it's usually so important to have these have these protections. I also thought it was quite interesting, though, that um, um, and I, I want to explore a little bit more in a minute how um, it sounds like in much of Latin America, it's it's a little bit of a different approach. You don't have this great big safe harbor approach necessarily, um, and that's very interesting to me to me as well. Um, so let's turn now to to a set of sort of provocative questions, and the idea here is that I'm going to pose the, a question to to one of our panelists, um, but then other, uh, other panelists can kind of jump in if they have further thoughts. And I'll just try to keep us all steered um, in, in a direction. Um, and then again, we'll open it up to, to audience questions. So please um, you know, have questions ready because we want to hear from you as well. This is, I'm, I'm looking at the group of people we have here and there's a lot of folks who I, I know are very, very smart and learned. And so I really want to have it be a real conversation. Okay, so, um, so let's, go back um, to, to the EU. Um, so one thing we talked about how um, um, the NetCG can be sort of a blueprint, um, the bad parts of it <laughs> can be a blueprint for, for less liberal countries. And, um, and one of those um, blueprints that I've seen um, is the ways in which there are also policy gaps. Um, and that and to which states can insert themselves um, in ways in which platforms can end up being vulnerable um, to state pressure. And I, I know that's something, um, Emily, that you've studied and, and um, researched. And I wonder if you could talk a little bit about those gaps and what, how we, what we might do about them. Thanks. Um, so I think what I, or what is really difficult to, the, the gap I see here, the biggest, is really the, the contradiction between um, the global, like global platforms, a global um, business model, and then local laws. Um, I think it's, it's incredibly um, difficult to solve uh, and to, to address by, by platforms. Um, and um, I think everything we, we all three of us said so far, all four of us said so far, really, really um, um, reinforced that. So um, there's a recent case um, by the, or from last year, but from the European Court of Justice in an Austrian case that you probably heard of the um, Glavi Schnick versus Facebook case. And in that case, the, 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 the court of, uh, of uh, justice ruled that unlawful content would have to be deleted uh, worldwide. Um, and at the same time, uh, we actually have this safe harbor rule of, um, of Article 14, but also Article 15 that explicitly forbids states to, to um, obligate uh, content uh, or web hosters or social networks to monitor their users. So this is the first framework. And then now with the up, updating the digital, the e-commerce the, the e directive and looking at a digital services act that will be, we hope, or we'll, we, we hope to see the, the first draft in December, um, there are even other rules coming up. And, and, and what, meanwhile, we haven't even um, um, transposed the, the, the copyright directive yet. Um, and, and Article 17 was already mentioned. So I think that there's, there are a lot of rules and a lot of laws, and at the same time, um, they might be contradictory, and it just, um, yeah, it's very difficult for, I think that platforms can do a lot against online harms, but I also see that being compliant with so many different rules uh, isn't easy, and there are contradictions within the law that not even the lawmakers know how to solve. So 
um, I, th I think that's a, that's a different, big difficulty. And how have you seen that manifested, um, particularly in terms of, of you know, state pressure? Well, but so state pressure um, is so I think I, I don't have an, a case uh, right now that I that I would but but I think that the increase or the the fact that the net CG was replicated in a, an even always more um, like um, restrictive way. So indeed, we have this 24 hours rules, but up to seven days. And then um, uh, France, for example, had a very similar law against hate speech that was annulled in summer, but they had for some types of content only one hour to remove, con to remove the content. Um, and um, at the same time, um, we see similar laws in in Turkey as well. So I don't, I haven't seen a use of, for say, say for example, the net CG uh, of how a state pressured a, a company. Um, I think that the fines do work. I think, but there's also public pressure in these matters. Um, um, so that that also forces platforms to 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 react. Um, but I see that. Countries have been indeed just the the the, the measures are beca becoming uh, more restrictive um, after after a while. Okay, um, Nishi or Andres, do you have any thoughts on on this topic? In particular, the ways in which I, what I was sort of thinking about are the ways in which sometimes states take advantage of these of these laws um, that I, I don't think are actually designed for governments to take advantage of necessarily, but that doesn't stop the governments from taking advantage of them anyway. Um, and I'm wondering if either of you have thoughts on that. Right. Um, your question re remind me of, of some litigation that I, I believe that has uh, ensue in, in Brazil regarding in, in an electoral context, but but I but I don't believe that they use the Marco Civil, but 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 instead they try to use other bodies of the law, such as copyright law, uh, to um, from political parties and from the government to try to take down some some. Uh, some content that that would put them in a bad light before the citizens. So um, the the idea th that is a, actually a legal way, but but a bad use of a legal way to to make pressure on those platforms. But if we are talking about uh, something more informal, like jaboning, right, uh, using those gaps. In mm -hmm. the law to to informally pressure uh, online uh, intermediaries, I believe that 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 it's possible that that we haven't seen much of that in Latin America, because the uh, even if there if there was that wish to 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 pressure those intermediaries, normally they don't find nobody at, at the other side of the table. They they don't engage in that conversation uh, because. They reject the, the this whole idea of, of jurisdiction. Is is as you mentioned. They 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 only say that they, they have a sales office or or a PR office. So in that regard, it, it is more coherent for their defense not to um, um, abide or, or to answer the door once the uh, an authority or a political party is, is knocking. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, Michelle, any thoughts on this? Um, yeah, um, so as I said, but the power negotiation is happening between the companies and, and the government a lot of times, at least in India, we saw that uh, uh, because there is this um, con contingent on uh, compliance with certain due diligence rules, um, the executive tries to use them uh, for something which is um, like censorship by proxy, um, the political party in power would not like certain things. And if you can codify it somewhere, which is only an executive thing, then it is much easier to pressurize a platform company. Now, um, of course, the transparency reports, et cetera, don't really tell us anything. They just tell us some 
uh, quantitative data. It's not qualitative and substantive enough for us to understand what's really going on. Um, we can only uh, figure out if something comes out in public. Uh, for those of you who followed, um, there was a, a WSJ story followed by a Time story, which was about, um, uh, at least it was alleged that um, uh, Facebook was not taking down content, which was uh, perhaps um, otherwise would have violated certain terms and services or was could have been categorized as hate speech or something else but uh, was by some of the members of the current ruling party. And that created a lot of um, controversy. And, uh, and then uh, the public started to demand, why isn't something being done about this? Without realizing that once you actually make something into law, then it applies across the board. The second thing I would say is, which we've noticed is, um, although there is this safe harbor, but there is this constant demand um, uh, there are copyright rules, there are various other things, but there is this constant demand uh, either by courts at all the levels or just in general by the governments, why aren't we doing something? Um, of course, nuance is hard and social media is a nuance destruction machine. So something which is trending on social media then becomes uh, uh, what you discuss on prime time and then all of that thing becomes a, a very difficult way to understand it. So something which has happened in the past one week in India is um, a stand-up comedian um, has an opinion about a Supreme Court judgment. And he says something, and he uh, says something in the sense of that the judiciary has become subservient. They are not keeping the current government in check. And uh, there is an entire brouhaha about him. But a parliamentary committee, which is looking into data protection bill, summons Twitter to ask, why are you hosting this objectionable content on Twitter? And Twitter was like, ah, you don't understand. That's user generated content. If you have a problem, if it's defamatory, if it is contempt of court, why don't you give me a court order? And uh, Twitter rightly says, you have a law. It is safe harbor. Unless you bring me a court order or a government notification, I only have to see whether that thing um, is in violation of my terms and services or not. Um, so um, the, the parliamentarians are demanding, no, take an action within seven days. And the companies are now left with this unpredictable um, regime, which is if there's no predictability, how does business work? And this we are talking about a very large corporation which can afford a team of lawyers, which understands all of this. We're not even talking about smaller platforms or the indigenous ones or the local ones who may not have all the wherewithal to deal with all this. Um, having said that, it's not that the companies themselves uh, are not to be blamed for several things because a lot of times they would just not remove data, even when it is on the face of it, very clearly violation of in violation of their own terms and services. So, um, I think that that kind of confusion is um, definitely um, uh, used by the governments for their own advantage. Uh, and ostensibly, they're always trying to say this is for to check online harassment of women, because women obviously have no agency of their own. Uh, they always need somebody to protect them. And uh, or it is to check fake news or disinformation. Yeah. Um, that's certainly something we see in the United States as well. It's um, also protecting the children. And the problem is, of course, sometimes there are legitimate, you know, there's a version of that that's not incorrect, um, but the legal, prop the legal proposals um, do often do not match up particularly well with um, what's supposedly the goal. Um, okay, let me, let's switch gears just a little bit. I wanna get back to, to um, Andres's um, comment, which I think is is you know very relevant um, in a lot of different areas, um, that um, the discussion of, of intermediary liability, you know, brings in actually a host of different kinds of laws that aren't just the safe harbor laws, um, or even the you know the intermediary liability laws. It brings in uh, increasingly in the discussion, people are talking about competition, people are talking about privacy and consumer protection. Um, and um, and looking to a lot of these different areas of laws when they think about platforms, um, and a lot of the and and that of course is going to have implications for speech. 
um, as well in expression. So um, Andres, could you talk a little bit about how you're seeing that in your work? Yes, thank you. So uh, I, I, what I've seen is that uh, there has probably been two trends in both in Peru and in Latin America regarding expansion of intermediary liability to other areas of the law. The first one is related to uh, data protection. So uh, several Latin American countries already have uh, in action um, some data protection regimes. In Peru, we have one since 2011. And um, that, uh, that gave way to uh, some people asking for um, um, search engines or uh, social media companies to take down some information because uh, they didn't have the proper consent to processing their information or because they th that information depicted in a bad light. So they um, it, they took the the uh, the Spanish and, and European case law with the right to be forgotten uh, as a precedent to uh, import it in in. Peru and in other Latin American countries. Not all of them, I, I believe that it is only certain that, that in Peru, the, uh, an administrative body in charge of, of data protection has actually recognized an, a specific right to be forgotten in 2016. So, but the discussion is still ongoing. It, there's a, a still litigation in other countries, despite the fact that a court at some point rejected the idea of an autonomous right to be forgotten. And in some cases, it has been used to, uh, uh, to trump uh, freedom of expression, to, to protect some uh, public figure or public authority from, um, from people learning bad things about their past. And I believe that, that there has been a recent case uh, with a very problematic reasoning in Argentina that went in a different direction that the precedent uh, case law, which is the case of, of Belen Rodriguez, that rejected the idea of, of, of the right to be forgotten. So th that is one trend uh, that, that users have uh, uh, asked some courts or, or administrative bodies to remove some content via data protection laws. Um, learning from, I believe, what could be the, the bad takeaways of, of the data protection law in, in Europe, right? This, this is another case where, where um, some bad lessons can, can be easily replicated in, in, in other countries. The other trend, uh, which I believe is, is more recent, and, and this is what, what I've been researching in, in the last couple of months, is um, um, the use of consumer protection laws to ask some platforms, mostly e-commerce platforms, to take down uh, some content that is uh, dangerous or that is uh, a hoax. Uh, for instance, recently, because of COVID-19, there were some miraculous uh, medicines to fight COVID-19 being sold in, uh, in marketplaces uh, such as uh, Mercado Libre, for instance, which is like the largest I, I believe the largest um, a, a marketplace, online marketplace in, in Latin America. And um, that, has, uh, that, that has had um, some impact on consumer protection agencies in Peru and in Colombia that I've already learned that have um, initiated administrative proceedings for infringement of consumer protection law for uh, the failure of those platforms to actively supervise the content generated by, by third party users. So, um, and, and this is obviously problematic, not only because of that standard, which is very different to the, the general or, or more admissible interme intermediary liability that we already have, which is either immunity or safe harbor or an active knowledge or a willful blindness to uh, to neglect the the infringement, but also because that could easily uh, expand to areas apart from consumer protection law. It, 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 it is the same principle that could be 
um, um, expanded to uh, social media or any other type of uh, interme online intermediary. So, um, and wh why is that happening? Uh, my, my hypothesis right now is, is that probably because um, some specialized, specialized bodies such as data protection agencies and consumer protection agencies in Latin America are perceived as better, um, uh, as having a, a better technical knowledge of the law and being more readily available for, for people than the judiciary in, in some countries. And the other reason why this is happening is um, uh, because uh, um, the, the lack of certitude in defamation law or in intermediary law as, as a general concept that has um, made um, some people and some lawyers to, uh, to go to that area uh, to try to find uh, a gap for, for their cases and for having uh, those platforms uh, being more active in moderation and in filtering some third party contents. That is really interesting. And I, I think that we see that in the United States as well. Um, you know, well, I mean, it's, it's, it's natural <laughs> with, uh, if you've got uh, smart lawyers and smart clients that you can't find your answer one way, you go to a different area. Um, but it, it gets kind of very complicated, I think, because um, I don't think that consumer protection law, um, it, maybe it's different um, in Latin America, but I don't think of consumer protection law doesn't have the same kind of built-in safeguards for, uh, for speech, or at least built-in consideration about um, human rights and, and free expression that, that we have in, in some other areas. So it's really um, a challenge to sort of introduce that. I think sometimes in my experience as a litigator, judges will look at you and say that's not my issue <laughs> why are you asking me this question this isn't what this is about there's no category or defense for that um so it's a yes <laughs> it's a it's a problem i mean it's understandable you know if you can't people want a remedy um but then you, you have attention when that when there are when there isn't that balancing that you see at least in the defamation space um we're coming a little bit up on, on time to, to open things up for questions. So I want to, but I want to hit one last thing um, before we do. Um, and then I want to hear from the audience. But one of the things, Mishi, that you talked about um, at the end of your remarks um, that I, I also want to come back to is that I think is related actually is how um, um, changes to the safe harbors in various regions and various versions of safe harbor laws are, going to, are having an impact on a lot of other um, uh, um, um, internet protections or di digital rights that were um, issues that we're concerned about. And in particular, um, the issue of end-to-end -end encryption. And I, I think that's important to talk about. It's very relevant to the conversation that's happening in the United States as well. So I wonder if you could expand on that a little bit um, from your perspective. Sure. Um, so, uh, of course, the uh, I think it's a lot to do um, with the, the conversation always, um, or rather, I would say, still being presented as privacy versus security rather than security security. And uh, that kind of a black and white thing does work for um, uh, the law enforcement uh, agencies almost in every country. Uh, without, uh, uh, with just uh, deliberately omitting that encryption is not just about you and me using either WhatsApp or um, Signal, but it also makes, uh, whether it is the public key infrastructure or it is everything else, it also makes a lot of other things possible on our, in our digital lives. And um, uh, so um, I would say, that more often than not, um, that conversation is still presented in that way uh, to a very large audience. And uh, whether it is the US um, uh, Congress, both the House and the Senate hearings or the UK or otherwise, um, uh, one can say how it is so easy um, for us to stay only on the top and uh, rhetoric to come out rather than actual any 
a real uh, question and answering happening between the lawmakers as well as the companies. So that really gets pushed. Now, in terms of Indian context also, I think, um, uh, again, um, now I would start with the, this thing about the WhatsApp lynching, the problems in Myanmar, which Facebook was having. Um, uh, but that all, uh, if, if in India only one, one were to see, there is a lot of misinformation, disinformation, which gets circulated around. And when the uh, safe harbor uh, rules, which are now in the draft stage, when they were presented in 2018, um, because ostensibly the reason is to check fake news, they obviously have one provision, which is about traceability. Now, traceability of uh, who is the originator of that particular message is the idea. And then what they would like is for the platform to help them to figure out who is the person who originated that. Now, um, uh, of course, um, uh, Facebook does, uh, WhatsApp does have the same protocol as Signal, but of course the data collection is a little different. Now, not that they can actually verify whether a particular message comes from one place or the other. Compounded with the fact that um, uh, other jurisdictions also are now forcing, whether we see what happened in Australia or the statements which have come out from UK, um, or the open letter which the US, UK, Australian governments had issued to Facebook. Um, uh, all of these things uh, embolden a government anywhere else to say, well, if so many people are demanding, I'm sure they're going to find some way or the other. And this is may, it, it's easy to stick it in somewhere like a traceability requirement in a safe harbor thing. Oh, this is your responsibility. But this also tells us that uh, that uh, companies or the intermediaries who we are talking about, they are not the same entities as they were even 10 years ago or 15 years ago. They have now metamorphosized into something much bigger. And I'm not talking about oligopolies or monopolies. I'm just talking about the various functions they perform. If there is a WhatsApp or an Instagram or a Facebook, all of them are doing something different, but now they have a very different role to play in our lives also. Or a Google, just imagine the kind of, uh, the kind of um, uh, products of coming out of Google that we all use. And to be, and, uh, but, the, but the laws that are coming, they seem to be still treating all of these as the same intermediary. And that doesn't really work. Um, we did see a little bit of, um, uh, we see a lot of problem with the current MLAT structure in which a lot of law enforcement agencies were still not able to get access to data. But there was at least, there has been some change like the coming of the Cloud Act, which was also enacted in 2018 in the US, which is about the lawful overseas use of data which at least says that um, uh, authorized US and UK law enforcement agencies can ask technology uh, companies based in their partner countries for some electronic data. That doesn't mean every country is part of that or is authorized to receive that data. And that has often been used by the law enforcement agencies to say, oh, uh, to get a much larger um, uh, control over how the intermediaries uh, work than what the limited thing one can require. So um, I will say that um, uh, more often than not, we are looking that there are a, a lot of different kinds of intermediaries are now being, uh, are still being treated the same way as they were and not really trying to figure out that each of their product also perhaps needs a different kind of regulation. And um, uh, one thing I will say, despite the fact that uh, most of these companies users um, are, or their biggest markets are outside the United States. They really don't take any other country very seriously. And, uh, and I say that not flippantly or frivolously, but I would say that um, before the 2016 elections, a lot of this was going on in many other countries, the election interference, but we only saw real action when the 2016 elections happened. So, um, it's not wrong and it, it puts us in a precarious situation because we know that the governments are going to try to use this for political censorship or their own benefits also. And the companies, when they don't actually uh, either share data or try to be cooperative, even in 
cases where there might be an actual crime or some hate speech which needs to be taken down, then um, it's very difficult to argue for free speech and expression or breaking of right to privacy on one side or the other. And the user is stuck. And consumer protection is not very strong in many, many countries. And right now, unlike Latin America, um, we are still not, the jurisprudence is not really developed on that aspect that you can use that law to go. And as much as I like law because it pays my bills and uh, um, it, law is slow and it only, and courts can only um, rule on a very narrow uh, piece of um, information or the questions which are presented before them. And many courts are like the US Supreme Court. They just want to avoid big things and do a narrow ruling if they can avoid. So it's a complicated process where the user is usually stuck between this very powerful government and these very powerful companies, and then usually lost to see where we are going. Uh, we do like end-to-end -end encryption. We want to be able to talk to our families, our friends without the government sitting in, in the middle or uh, any of the employees of the company sitting in. Um, but, uh, uh, if, if, you, if somebody comes and presents to me, oh my God, child pornography or ter terrorism is going to happen if you would be talking with this tool, how am I supposed to answer that question? And that is why we need more nuanced discussion. And I thought after like several years or decades of all of this discussion, we would have moved to that place. But obviously it serves some purposes to keep that discussion still at the nascent level. Right. Thank you. Um, and I do think there... Right, and I think part of part of it too is um, the discussions happening in many different places and many different stages. Um, but again, at this point, everything's interconnected and people are still talking to each other. So it's, are we gonna have a race to the bottom or a race to the top? Um, okay, we have about a um, little more than 10 minutes left. Um, and I would love to open it up now to questions from the audience. I see there's some interesting conversations happening in the chat about consumer protection law. Um, so let's bring the, the conversation to the group. Does anyone have a, a question they would like to ask our panelists? Um, I think Roberto Patterson does. Um, so just uh, unmute yourself, I think is all you need to do. And for other folks, if you just use the um, raise hand mechanism, I will see you and I will, um, uh, Kyoko um, Yoshinaga is next on stack. But first, let's have Roberto. Yes, thank you. And thank you all the panelists for your time and your, your expertise. So my question is, so when we're looking at these social media platforms or these intermediaries, for a long time, it's been quite clear that they will, that their incremental change is a sort of a way to avoid taking on the role of a publisher since that introduces a whole lot of other sort of regulations that they wish to dodge. But so if we're to allow them safe harbor to take, sort of take a step back away from the uh, user created content, uh, how are we supposed to sort of grapple with situations, let's say in places where it's less socially stable or where the sort of these information cascades can turn interaction into reaction into harm. So like, you know, for example, in Nigeria, when a fake article comes up accusing Muslims of uh, violence against Christians and, you know, the next day that results in violence. How are we supposed to sort of engage with that situation or that problem in these places if we're going to continue to sort of allow social media platforms or intermediaries to have that, be, that ability to take the step back? Like, how do we move forward from there? Okay, great question. Uh, I'll throw it open to the panelists. Anyone? Andres? Oh, go ahead. Sorry. Go ahead and just un unmute yourself yes. when you watch that. Yes. Well, well I, I believe that that that, um, that idea of, of platforms um, uh, dis distancing themselves from, from the publisher position is valid from the US perspective, where do you have a, a, a very a clear distinction, or or at least clear, uh, looks to be clear distinction between publisher and and, and intermediary. So um, in other countries, there th that distinction might not be so useful for 
either having a safe harbor or um, fulfilling the promise made to the users of that platform that, that it's in some cases to provide a, a safe environment for conversation or for commerce, right? So um, I, I believe that is, this is not the only problem, but part of the problem is that uh, some platforms had a, a they claim to have a global view about how the conversation between billions of people should be, uh, but they had that intention with a very narrow legal glasses that had in mind that 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 very specific U.S. distinction between publisher and, and intermediary. So um, that, that 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 is to say that, for instance, in a case like in Nigeria, their approach shouldn't necessarily be mandated by the safe harbor that they have they already have in the U.S. So th that's I, I I believe that uh, that's my take on 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 this problem and the lack of, um, I, um, how to put it, um, um, of flexibility of those platforms to adapt to, to realities in, in different countries where, where they operate. Thanks, Andres. And, and I should say, by the way, um, for, for folks with questions, if you wanna direct it to a particular panelist, that's fine, or you can just send it out to the, to the whole thing. If you have a particular panelist in mind, just, just let us know. Um, I'm going to move on to another question because I want to make sure that um, the folks on stack ha have a chance. Um, so Kyoko, go ahead. Yes. Thank you so much for the very interesting panel. I'm learning a lot from global context. I'm a researcher at a think tank in Japan and a senior fellow at Georgetown Institute for Technology Law and Institute. But I'm still in Tokyo, so I'm, it's 1 a.m. right now. Um, I would like to quickly share how Japan is dealing with this issue right now. And as I have involved in, in the revision process of product liability limitation law in Japan in the past. And um, I would like to ask a short question to the panelists at the end. Um, in Japan, Japanese government tends to promote self-regulation by social media companies rather than imposing regulations on these companies by laws. As we think we should be extremely careful about the government's intervention as it relates to freedom of expression, which is stipulated in Japanese constitution, article 21, from the historical background. Um, we have the provider liability limitation law, which is a very short law, just uh, five articles that sets the limitation of ISP liability and sets the user's right to ask the ISP for the information of the offender to be disclosed. So like, for example, in Japan, users are using Twitter by pseudonyms and not real names. And it is really easy to get flamed on Twitter. So cyber harassment and cyber bullying is a huge social problem right now. And many young people commit suicide from being harassed online at SNS. So when a user is harassed online in Japan, he or she can demand a content provider for the IP address and the timestamp, and then demand an access provider, which is a telecom carrier for the names and address of the infringer based on this law. And based on these acquired information, the users can then claim the offender for damages in real like, um, uh, trial. And, but however, I think this current system is not good as it would be a, such a big burden on the harmed user as well as pose a problem on the freedom of speech and privacy of the person disclosed. If this demand for disclosure of identification information of the sender is not used in a proper way. And I think we should be really careful when making a global standard for content moderation because content is very cultural thing and what is considered harmful or illegal uh, varies according to the country and how, the, how users are using the SNS is really different in each country. So my current thought about this issue is that it is difficult to make a global standard 
but we may have a common principle like human rights. But for other parts, I think we should leave it to each country for the regulation. So I want to know what the panelists think about what should be set as a global standard and what should be left at lo local regulation. Thank That's, you. Um, that is a great question. Thank you so much. Um, so I'll throw it out to the to panel. Amelie, Michi? We have about five minutes left. So. Okay. <laughs> Sorry. Thank you so much for um, uh, saying, um, telling what's happening in Japan and also posing that question. Um, I'm sure the other panelists know a lot about this. I will say is that um, um, because so many of these large companies, at least the ones which we always at least tend to focus on, uh, were based in the United States, uh, First Amendment seemed to become the default of the internet. And as much as I am a fan of the US First Amendment, um, sometimes I have to remind people in India who were online and used to think, oh, I have First Amendment rights. And I'm like, yeah, but the Indian Constitution's First Amendment is actually reasonable restrictions on free speech and expression. Then they can restrict free speech and expression. So I know that the fact that we're all online, it seems there is supposed to be just one law. And uh, uh, as much as we would like to endeavor to aspire to that First Amendment level, and perhaps that kind of, uh, but most countries' reality is very, very different. And uh, what is happening, at least what I'm observing, and I don't know if I have good answers for this, is that uh, when it actually comes to give more rights to the users, then the governments tend to say, oh, but that's not what we have. We have restrictions. I have rights about X, Y, Z here. But when it comes to say something like rights of the government to say, oh, we have to do crime control, we have to do something else, then the sovereign just comes up in the middle and then they say, oh, the rest of the countries are also doing it like end-to-end -end encryption. So it is always a clever way of how that works. Um, as a person um, who likes to have, for, for people to be able to say whatever they would like, I'm also very much uh, cognizant of the fact that there are a lot of things which are leading to offline violence, which you and me may be able to uh, think Although with these days, it's very difficult to understand what is right, what is wrong, what is true, what is fake, actual. But we have seen real violence there. Uh, so um, for the time being, it's not going to be one kind of a thing which we can all agree on. However, the least restrictive paths, if we can endeavor towards and move, uh, those would be the best. Uh, but we need not just to carry the waters of the platform companies and say, oh, if you regulate them, then uh, we will just lose all our free speech and rights. We are dependent on them to speak to the world, but the companies will also have to do some of their part. If, for example, there is hate speech, there is something which is so obnoxious, and in some, in US it might not lead anywhere, but in some other place, in India, in, in, in Myanmar, it will lead to violence they will have to get proactive on their own. It is a very slippery slope and I'm aware of that, but I have not been able to find anywhere a good solution for it right now. So you're right, the, the ICCPR um, and uh, what the Universal Declaration is, those should be our North Stars and or the US First Amendment, but again, that time sovereignty comes in, but uh, we will be seeing very different versions right now. Thank you, Mishi. Um, Amelie, what do you think? Yeah, I'd love to, to add on this. Um, I think that um, the problem is part of the problem, because uh, so first of all, thank you so much for telling us um, about the situation in Japan. And and um, I think you mentioned at the beginning that um, you, plat you you or the, the position right now is to leave uh, leave it up to self-regulation. I think part of the problem really is what do we mean by self-regulation? Um, and we do not only mean that the platforms decide, we actually mean what Mishi has mentioned is that a very US centric uh, perspective is, um, is then being deployed somewhere else. And um, this, this, 
First Amendment um, uh, perspective um, is actually based on assumptions that are not equal somewhere else, are not somewhere else, present somewhere else. What I mean by that is we don't only, there is not only the law as Michelle also mentioned before. And that is something that I also try to say when, when I talk about the net CG is that we, the way we communicate is also so much based on social norms and they're so different from one region to another. So when you have a model that is based on the first amendment, but the social norms that maybe are present in the US are not present in that country, there's there's just, the gap is just also too big. Um, I've, I've been working on borderline speech and how platforms tend to remove um, more borderline speech than needed. And what might seem, might seem obscene uh, in the US or I don't know, somewhere else, uh, maybe in Europe, it's, it's kind of normal or it's accepted at least. So, in a sense, um, there is, um, the, we have to be very careful when it comes to freedom of expression, but if it means, if not regulating means leaving it up to A platforms and B, uh, a legal system that is not um, really consistent with, uh, with, the, with the norms, with the regional norms and the culture, then there's something, I mean, I don't think it's gonna work. So I think that it's somewhere in between all of that. Um, but yeah, I think it's something, the, 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 the regional differences are just too big to, to, to not be addressed. Okay. Well, thank you. Um, we're a little bit over time now. So, um, but I, those are very, very good questions. I'm glad, I'm glad we got it in. And I agree too, it was good to hear a little bit about what's going on um, in, in Japan. It's, you know, really, we, there's so much to cover and, uh, and so many different approaches that are really important uh, to pay attention to. Um, I, I think, I, I really hope that, um, that we find some good lessons being spread around and not and not just the bad ones. Um, and I know everyone on this call uh, agrees on that. Um, I wanna thank our panelists. Um, this was really interesting for me to moderate and, um, and hear from all of you. And um, I wanna just flag that the conversation's not over. There is, um, there's more um, discussion to come in the con uh, today in this conference, as I'm sure Michael will tell you. Um, and I know there's some follow-up um, conversations that, um, that are being organized as well. So I wanna thank the panelists very much um, for their time. Thank you to everyone um, online in the audience. And, and thank you for the, for the very, very thoughtful, uh, great questions. Yes, thanks so much to all of you. Thanks, Corinne, for, for a wonderful job moderating. It was great to hear uh, so many uh, incredible perspectives. It was, it was a wonderful discussion. Um, uh, the next session starts back up at uh, 1 Eastern time, so it's about an hour 40 minutes from now, and it's on uh, emerging accountability structures uh, for platforms, things like uh, GIFCT, GNI, uh, and the Facebook Oversight Board. Really looking forward to that discussion as well. Um, so see uh, some of you back in, in an hour 40. And thanks so much again. Thanks, Thank everyone. you. Thank Bye -bye. you. Thank you. Bye.